13. Twenty-four. Well, there was a few pots missed in the two opening frames. There was very little missed in that frame. It was just a little bit of unfortunate uh, sticking on a red for Ronnie O'Sullivan. But Ding's done what he needed to do, and he's got his first frame on the board. Two-one to Ronnie. And the defending champion looks like he's beginning to find his rhythm out there, particularly illustrated, I think, Steve, with that last red. That was terrific queuing, wasn't it? Yes, back to the wall in some ways, 2-0 down, and this last long red. Uh, I mean, a, a potential frame winner, but also, if he misses it, a potential match loser, because 3-0 Ronnie's a different story. Uh, and so Ding put everything into this, and he struck it so well. Enough screw back on to hold for the, for the colours, the bulk colours. Uh, he deserved all he got there, uh, and I think we can safely say now that both players have settled down in the match and yeah, a 2 1 advantage to Ronnie O'Sullivan. It takes a bit of doing because, as the guys in the commentary box have been saying, it's a new venue, it's a different kind of atmosphere out there. And, and I guess, in some respects, Ding was slow off the mark. Yeah, you, you can't really say totally missed the boat, but you do feel as if, I mean, Stephen made a very good point in commentary talking about match sharpness. You know, Ronnie's had a, a little period of rest over Christmas, not played in it, and you can't substitute match practice for what you do in the club. I mean, he'll, he'll come here, be well prepared, Ronnie, we know that, he'll put the hours in. But there's nothing like playing in matches and playing in them, you know, continually. And I think in the first couple of frames, Ding missed a big chance there, because you can see Ronnie wasn't match sharp. Mm. Um, and he's managed to get 2 nil in front, and he, he sort of missed the boat a little bit, but settled down after that long red, as Steve said, that was a fantastic shot. But you make a good point as well, John, and, and that, Steve, is that Ronnie was clearly suffering before Christmas time. He, he had a virus, he, he blamed a lot on, on the schedule. Maybe the rest has done him a little bit of good. Yes, I mean, in the space of a couple of years, we've gone from players saying that possibly they haven't had enough match practice to the possibilities of also being burnt out. But getting the balance is important. I think uh, when you look at the top quality standard of these players, they don't need much time before they're back in the rhythm. OK, back we go. Not a bad break-off shot again. Black not available into the left corner, so this pot down the right is not an option. There is a gap, believe it or not, just between green and blue and past the pink to snick off the reds. It is a bit thick, though. I think the black's available into the right corner, but there's no red to get onto that uh, shot. So I'll have to play for the blue off this one. <laughs> How well did he throw that? One. Hardly touched that, and the action he got onto it. with loads of left-hand side, which caused the white to spin up towards the bulk colours. That red next to the black would be a great one to get on, if he could. It really would. And if he's dead straight on that, it opens the black up. He's played it perfectly. Four. Yeah, if you watch when Ronnie plays screw shots, he, the tip come back, comes back almost to his thumb on his bridge hand. Allows him to get tremendous cue power through the ball. So smooth. Five. Yeah, you could see it even on that shot. The cue disappeared out of shot there. Players have settled down now. Twenty. Last frame. Twenty-one. Very little missed. Masters always has been. 
push to six, best of 11. Until we get through to the final. Mid-session interval coming up 29. after this frame. And Ronnie would be quietly pleased with a 3-1 advantage. Pot success rate. When you get into the 90s, you know you're queuing well. 36. Thirty-seven. Forty-three. You could hear a pin drop at the moment. Uh, Fifteen hundred people in capacity crowd for the first match 44. of this year's Masters. Fifty nine. Sixty. Just over four minutes for this effort. Coming up to four and a half minutes. So almost clinching the frame. A few pots away. It's not often you see a, a frame winning break without. Ronnie playing some shot to, to develop reds, but he's not to do anything in this break, so been pretty straightforward. 68. Well, someone's his position's been ideal as well. Uh, Ronnie Jr. there, who we've seen being introduced before the play started. He come down the stairs with his hands over his ears. The noise was unbelievable. 76. Frame safe, and this will develop the three reds. Maybe the first century ever seen at Alexander Palace. Possibility here. Not now, but he won't bother about missing the pink. 76 Ding nods the his head to the referee, he said it's enough. So two frames for both players are a little bit edgy, but Ronnie has settled the quicker, and he goes to the mid-session interval. Quietly pleased, leading three frames to one. And from what we've seen, that gentlemen, who for you looks the more in-touch player at the moment, Stevie? Um, well, I think Ronnie O'Sullivan in that last frame really did settle down. It was a, a beautifully constructed break. Break never got in trouble positionally and made it look so easy. Um, and, and going back to this venue, uh, or perhaps even the Masters, it is interesting that every match is like a final because there's only one table set up. All eyes are on you. In most other tournaments, you take, get time to get into the one table set up, and by that time, you're already off and running. You're, you're, you've got to the semi final stage at the very least. But you're day one, centre of attention, one table only. Certain players do well in venues like this, and others struggle a bit. And Ding, as yet, hasn't fulfilled his potential this season so far in this event. But ironically, it's Ronnie who's always loved this. And you wonder whether it's for that reason, and also perhaps the fact that it is a home crowd. He's absolutely worshipped around here in snooker circles, obviously, John. And how much do you think he thrives on, in this kind of atmosphere with that sort of support? Well, his, his record shows that he does. I also think the fact is if he can come here, he doesn't have to stay in a hotel, he can go home every day, come back, he's got a normal routine. The only difference to a normal routine is he's got a snooker match to play now and again. So he pops in, plays that generally wins and goes home but uh, he, he obviously loves the venue and the crowd here are fantastic with him when he got uh, the introduction today was absolutely brilliant and uh, 
it's a venue he loves. Obviously, not this one because it's the first time, yeah. but it's a tournament he loves. Yeah. Stephen and Dennis and I were talking just before we came on the air about the fact that this is a bit of a crossroads for Ronnie O'Sullivan in his career. Obviously, he's at world number 16 in the world rankings. And even he himself is quoted the other day as saying he feels he's either got to win the Welsh Open or the German Masters as the next two events in order to absolutely guarantee that he's going to be at the Crucible in mm. April. I mean, the fact that he might not be, for example, after 19 years, it's almost unthinkable, isn't it? Yes, uh, but obviously the ranking system is, is built up with ranking points and you get those for entering tournaments and playing and doing as well as you can in them. If you pull out of enough events, you're going to have this problem. And if Ronnie O'Sullivan doesn't commit to the whole season, this will be an ongoing problem. It's his choice, and I can understand. If he doesn't want to be away from home, if he doesn't want to do the travelling, he only wants to spend a certain amount of the year playing, that he's going to be penalised in one respect for our current ranking system. Um, and other players, if they play in everything, could have more mediocre performances and be above him in the, in, the, in the ranking list. In fact, he was very nearly out of the 60. Mark Davis could have knocked him, I think he was about mm. one frame away from knocking him out of the top 16 in Munich there. So these are, these are very difficult and indeed ch challenging times for Ronnie, aren't they? Yeah, he's got decisions to make in a, a concern in his own game. What I will say is if he has to go and qualify for the Crucible, there'll be a few people at home <laughs> looking at the draw thinking, I don't want him first round. <laughs> exactly, exactly, all right. Uh, well, I mentioned at Munich, which was the scene of the last PT see the player tour championships that's the, the smaller events that uh, are now uh, currently in vogue in, in snooker circles uh, and the winner of the last one last week in fact was Stephen Maguire and Stephen's going to be in action later this evening in our seven o'clock match I think many of his colleagues would certainly not ignore a person who's certainly coming back to form uh, and he's up against Mark Williams a two-time winner of this event the Masters but not since 2003 uh, let's just have a little bit more information about both men and in particular we'll delve into the Williams vault. Heaven knows what we'll find in there. I can get on with any, any, anyone really. I mean, you know, just like to have a laugh and, and wind people up, you know, I mean. Most of the people you meet are all like that, I find. But pretty much when you're out there playing, it doesn't really make any difference who you're playing against, because, well, for me, anyway, I just play the balls, and, and the opponent doesn't really, uh, really matter. Probably my motorbike, just because I like speed, really, and uh, um, the cars I had, nothing gives you the kind of speed you can get and the acceleration you can get from a bike. No, at one time I used to play lo lo lots and lots of badminton, probably three, three, four times a week, but apart from that, no, I haven't got any in talent. I wasn't really that good at that, to be fair. You always look at the draws, and if you're playing someone like, you know, Egan, Zenry, and O'Sullivan, people like that, that's the ones you know you're always, you're always going to enjoy. It's just the ones you don't know much about, really, that can uh, upset you, because you don't know what they're going to do. Getting the balance right between being far too nice to be a top-class competitor and having to go to anger management sessions <laughs> is, a, is a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, Stephen's um, definitely plays with his heart on his sleeve, yes. that's for sure. Um, but, you know, I must say that it definitely works for him. You know, I think, um, you yeah, know, he... Um, he expresses himself on the table, which is, you know, it's fantastic to see. And um, if he's not too happy, he lets everyone know about it. But, yeah, you know, it, it definitely works for him. Um, it can be really intimidating for his opponents as well. And, um, you know, just, just an awesome, awesome player when he's at the top of his game. I like to see somebody get annoyed. Uh, I mean, possibly in the past it was never considered to be the thing, but at least, you know, the guy's completely 100% committed, as long as he can control it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, you watch Stephen play and you can definitely tell when he's up for it or not. I mean, with me personally, I wouldn't be doing that myself. But like Neil says, it, it, does, it does help him and it seems to bring out the best in him. I mean, the last couple of seasons, he's probably not showed his potential, what he is as good at. But I mean, I've seen an interview a few seasons ago, which Stephen was speaking about him and he was saying that 
he could probably dominate the sport, the next person to dominate after Stephen. And at the time, I would have agreed. I mean, he was a great player and he still is a great player, but he's just lost his way a little bit.